Okay. So we've been talking about the heart, right? Blood vessels, blood, how the heart works, right? The SA node, the AV node, Purkinje fibers, the way in which the heart contracts, okay? We talked about regulating heart rate. We talked about cardiac output, which is heart rate and stroke volume and the like, okay? So we even talked a little bit about blood and the fact that it has hemoglobin on it. And our red blood cells have hemoglobin and how that improves our ability to carry oxygen. So now we're gonna get into why having that extra hemoglobin is important. We're gonna talk about how we carry gases around in the blood and how all of those gases are then going to help us to exercise and whatnot. So we're gonna start off by talking about oxygen transport. And so this is one of the primary things that goes on with arterial blood. One of the big things that's in there, one of the primary things that's in arterial blood that is good is oxygen. We have lots of oxygen in arterial blood, less in venous flow. We're bringing oxygen from our environment, okay? into the lungs, get it into the blood, and then send it off to our peripheral tissue so they can use it for energy. And we can contract the muscles, we can contract the heart, we can contract the diaphragm, we can breathe, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if we look at O2 transport, about 98% of the oxygen in your blood is bound to hemoglobin, okay? It's all bound to hemoglobin. There's a small percent a very small percent that's just dissolved in plasma. You can dissolve oxygen in water, but it doesn't do nearly as well as say like CO2 and those things. Okay. The reason that it's bound to hemoglobin, okay, is because of the heme molecules, because of the iron in the hemoglobin. This allows us to transport about 70 times more oxygen than we could if you didn't have hemoglobin on your red blood cells. Okay. So having hemoglobin is a tremendous advantage, tremendous advantage for, for being able to do all of this. Okay? This allows then for this giant amount of oxygen, which can create this very, very large diffusion gradient. Okay? I'll mention this now. You guys remember what diffusion is? Who remembers what diffusion is? Anybody? Diffusion? Anybody? No? Okay. If, and I don't have one of these, but if I had, let's just say, something that smelled bad, I had one of my daughter's dirty diapers and I threw it over there on the other side of Michaela and Kinsey, would you all diffuse this direction? Probably, right? You're going to move from an area of a high concentration of the bad smell to an area of the lower concentration. Okay? Diffusion is how gases and fluids, and a lot of things are going to move, okay? That's how they're going to move. They're gonna move from an area of a high concentration to an area of a low concentration. In order to do that, okay, we have to set up a system or set up a kind of an environment where there's a lot of something. There is a high concentration in some place and a relatively lower one in others. So we use the hemoglobin to bind all of this oxygen and create this giant diffusion gradient where there's all of this oxygen in arterial blood, all of this oxygen on the red blood cells are gonna get into your capillaries and a little small amount that's in the peripheral tissues. So there's this very, very big gradient. So it wants that oxygen wants to come off of the hemoglobin, move into the tissue, okay? Because there's a big diffusion gradient. That's the real advantage of having hemoglobin. At sea level, we're roughly a little bit above, but not very much here above sea level in Norman. Okay. There is a known amount of oxygen in the air. It's not quite 21%, right? We have a relatively normal atmospheric pressure of about 760 millimeters of mercury. There's a huge amount of oxygen in the air. And we're going to put a bunch of that oxygen onto our hemoglobin. Hemoglobin generally is going to be somewhere north of 95% saturated um, if you are at sea level or thereabouts and you have normal lung function. 
When you go to the doctor's office, again, I should have brought it. They put the little thing on your finger. It tells you what your pulse oxygen is. What they're measuring is the amount of hemoglobin in your capillaries that has oxygen bound to it, okay? I can explain to you the physics of how all of that works um, about oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and you shine your infrared light in and they're reflected and diffracted at different things. But what that tells us is that if you have good lung function, this is why it's so useful for diagnosing people that have COVID that need to, or need to go to the, to the hospital. Lots of O2 in the air. You're putting most of it onto your hemoglobin. That means your lungs are functioning really, really well, okay? Hemoglobin saturation falls below 90%. You probably need to go to the emergency room, okay? You probably need to go. So lots of oxygen, that's going to be good, okay? Way, way higher than what we actually need. Way higher, okay? which is also good. Because of all of this, and this may be a hard concept to understand, is that during exercise at relatively moderate altitudes down to sea level, as long as you have good lung function or normal pulmonary lung function, okay, oxygen and oxygen's carrying capacity in your blood is rarely going to be the limiting factor in why you can't perform a certain bout of exercise. You go to altitude, we take you up to base camp on Mount Everest. That's very, very different, okay? We take you up onto Pikes Peak in Colorado. That's very different. Because you're at altitude, there's less air, so there's less uh, partial pressure of oxygen. You get less saturation, and then it becomes an issue. But generally, most of the time in you guys, lack of oxygen is not a thing that's going to cause problems during exercise. If you stop, it's because of other things, not because of the lack of oxygen. That's really important for us to keep in mind. All right, now let's talk about CO2. We also transport carbon dioxide in our blood. And in some ways, we use CO2 to regulate oxygen, which is gonna maybe seem a little bit backwards to you guys, okay? So you're using oxygen to tissues. When it goes through, we go through the Krebs cycle, right, we go down the electron transport chain, oxygen is the final electron acceptor, but through the Krebs cycle, and at one place in glycolysis, as we strip carbons off of glucose, those carbons are going to form carbon dioxide, okay? So you use oxygen to make energy along with some sort of carbon-based substrate, and the byproduct of that is CO2. That CO2 then comes out of that muscle, out of that brain tissue, out of that cardiac muscle, okay? Goes into the capillaries, into venous blood and then comes back to the heart and goes to the lungs. Unlike oxygen, CO2 is carried in sort of three meaningful ways in the blood. The first is you're gonna have maybe 10% or so that just dissolves in the plasma. It's easier to dissolve CO2 in water than it is to dissolve oxygen, okay? Anytime you have a Coke, and I mean that kind of colloquially, like any sort of carbonated beverage, what's in there is CO2 easier to put it into water. Somewhere between a fifth to a third is going to bind onto hemoglobin. When you have hemoglobin that doesn't have oxygen on it, you can bind CO2 onto it. That is called carb amino hemoglobin. Okay? And then the vast majority of the CO2 in your blood is going to exist as sort of a buffering pro product of CO2 and water, and it's called bicarbonate, okay? So bicarbonate results from the dissociation of carbonic acid. You put an acid in water and it dissociates, which means it gives up its hydrogen ion, okay? It makes the fluid more acidic, but so you're going to, you're gonna get CO2 goes into water, those things mash together, they form carbonic acid, the carbonic acid then dissociates, you get hydrogen, which lowers the pH of your blood, and you get bicarbonate, or HCO minus. So floating around in your blood is carbon dioxide that is trapped or existing as bicarbonate, okay? As bicarbonate. 
Now, you may say, well, Dr. Black, why is that a meaningful thing? Why would we do something like all of that? So I'll ask it in this way. Hi, you ever had an upset stomach? Yes. You ever taken some kind of medicine for your upset stomach that is like Tums or Maalox or Melanta, something like that? Yeah. Okay. You might ever had acid reflux and done the same. You had acid reflux here. It's just an old man thing. Don't worry, y'all will have it. Ladies, when y'all get pregnant, oh, the acid reflux. Let me tell you. My wife went through bottles and bottles of Tums. It's a, kind of a, a thing of being pregnant. Guess what's in that? Bicarbonate. Okay. Bicarbonate is a base. And what it does is it soaks up and neutralizes these hydrogen ions and lowers the pH, or raises the pH. Sorry. Okay. And so what happens when you do all of this is the CO2 exists in bicarbonate. Every once in a while, some of that binds back together with those free hydrogen ions and it buffers them. It neutralizes the acid from those hy that hydrogen ion and the reaction goes back in the other direction. And that happens near the lungs and then it, the CO2 comes out and you breathe the CO2 off, okay? And so it's a rather complex biochemical reaction. Um, it takes place in multiple different tissues, some at the lungs, some at the tissue, the other tissue levels. If you take biochemistry, y'all will talk about this more. But the big thing is this is good for exercise that you do this, okay? Because in your blood, you have tums floating around. So when you do high intensity exercise, and you make lactic acid as a, we won't call it a byproduct, but you will, you will exceed the ability, you'll, you'll make more pyruvate than can be handled in your mitochondria, and you start making lactic acid through glycolysis. That, lac, that dissociates into hydrogen ions and lactate, and that bicarbonate will buffer some of that, and that way you will not fatigue yet because of some of this. It's a really cool thing. Dr. Mike talks a lot about this. It's called isocapnic buffering that occurs during exercise. So you can, if you want to, you can actually make yourself better at doing high intensity exercise. Repeated sprints, potentially sort of reps to failure, lifting weights, things like that by eating a huge amount of tones or drinking a whole bottle of Mylanta or Maalox or something like that. How you're smirking at it. On that. Have you done this before? No, that sounds horrible. Sounds terrible. Tums aren't that bad. Like every morning, just about, my daughter runs into our, our medicine cabinet and gets the bottle of Tums down because she thinks it's fun. She thinks it's medicine. And, and she brings me one. She thinks it's like her duty to get daddy a, a Tums. She's never seen me take them before. Um, we tried to give her one one time and she didn't like it. But now she can reach them and they're colorful. So she thinks they're like candy. Um, on, on all of those things. What I would tell you guys, if you have some at home, look at the back of the thing. You take a little bit and it's good for like, they'll call it sour stomach or upset stomach. You take a lot and you know what it does? It's a laxative. So it may help you sprint better, but you may spend some of that time sprinting to the bathroom. Um, there's a fair amount of research that if you supplement with bicarbonate, bicarbonate loads it will improve repeat sprint and exercise. So any of you are going to do things like that, you're going to the CrossFit games or whatever it is that you're, you're going to undertake, think about doing bicarbonate loads. It's, it's perfectly legal and it's not really going to harm you other than you may get diarrhea at the end of the whole thing. Okay. So here's gas exchange. This is in the capillary. Imagine this is a muscle fiber. Here's our capillary. You've got your red blood cell. We've got oxygen bound to hemoglobin, right? O2 wants to come off of the hemoglobin and into the tissue because there's high amounts here, low amounts there, so big diffusion gradient. CO2 comes out of the tissue. Some goes onto hemoglobin. Some is going to right, come in right in this particular way and get dissolved. And then some is going to, through this complicated pathway, come in. CO2 in this, we're going to make carbonic acid. This is what I'm talking about, that it happens across tissues. This actually happens in the red blood cell. You make the carbonic acid, 
We're going to balance the acid and we're going to spit out some hydrogen and spit out some uh, some HCO3, some bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is like a lot. Don't worry about all of the biochemistry of this, but it just shows you that high O2, low O2, oxygen moves this way. Higher, but not quite as high CO2 here, it comes out and we get it into the blood so that we can then send it off to the lungs and breathe it off and keep our CO2 levels low. Okay? CO2 is interesting, all right? If I told you, mm, let's do something, let's do something fun here really, really quickly, which we will get into in a little bit. Geraldine, can you do me a favor? Can you hold your breath? How long do you think you can hold your breath? Not very long. Having the mask on kind of uh, defeats some of this, but think you can hold your breath for 30 seconds. Okay. You want to try? All right, here we're going to go. All right. Ooh, I'm watching the, the second hand. It's now like not moving up there. What the crap? That's weird as hell. Like, watch it. It doesn't move, then it goes and it flies around. I'm not, I'm like, this is not a horror movie or something. Um, all right, let me get this up. I'm going to stop watch. Ready? Everybody do this with your own name. We're going to hold our breath for 30 seconds, okay? Ready and go. We didn't quite make it. Okay, but that's the perfect reaction. What did Geraldine do right when she when she stopped? What did all of the rest of you do right when you stopped? What happened to how big of a breath you took when you were done in comparison to normal? It's huge, right? Why is it so big? Why is all of you, why is Geraldine breathing faster now than she was before? Too much carbon dioxide, very good. Too much CO2. CO2 levels in, weirdly enough, in arterial blood, CO2 levels are the primary regulator of breathing depth and breathing frequency. So it is important for us to get the CO2 out of the tissues, okay? More CO2 coming out of our tissues tells us that we're using more oxygen. So as CO2 and venous blood goes up, you're going to breathe off some, but we're always a little bit off on the breathing. So you end up with slightly elevated levels in arterial blood. That tells the brain, breathe faster, breathe more deeply, get rid of this extra CO2, get more oxygen in. Okay. You would think that breathing should be regulated by oxygen because that's the thing that we're monitoring. The tissues need the oxygen. But in fact, we do the opposite. But that's why understanding how and where the CO2 is, how and where the diffusion gradients are and how they work is amazingly important. When you exercise, you start using more oxygen in the tissues, you make more CO2, boom, immediately breathing goes up, okay? Immediately it goes up. We can tell Michaela that she's about to exercise. Her heart rate goes up, the breathing goes up immediately if she's never even done it. Okay, this is the thing that happens. It's really, really cool. Okay, that's how our physiology is going to be regulated. Now, what I want to show you guys next is something called the arterial venous oxygen difference. Okay, all this is is a mathematical equation, and it's a way for us to quantify how much oxygen has gone from the blood into a particular tissue. Okay. Let's just say, easy, easy math. I have 10 molecules of oxygen in arterial blood that has entered a capillary, okay? I have four molecules of oxygen in the venous blood that is leaving that capillary, okay? Let's do some, some, easy, some easy math. Okay, how much went into the tissues? 10 on one side, four on the other side. How much got taken into the tissue? Six, very good. That's arterial venous oxygen difference, okay? 
if you know what's going in and you know what's come out, then the difference is what stayed in the tissue. This is a way for us to measure something we call oxygen extraction. Oxygen extraction. Now, this is really difficult for us to measure in, in practice. Okay. Hey, have you ever had a you ever had a catheter put in like in, in an artery or a vein? Not a urinary catheter, but one like you ever had like you were given blood or anything? You ever had a vena puncture? Okay. When you give blood, a lot of the times they put a little catheter in, they do it in a vein. Okay. Now, if I want to measure your arterial venous oxygen difference. I have to put a catheter in so I can sample blood on both the arterial and the venous side. Anybody ever seen an arterial catheter placed? No? Okay. If you want to find, if you want to be a really, really, really good cardiology nurse, okay, you need to be able to set arterial catheters, arterial lines. I've only seen it attempted once in my life, and it was a cardiologist that tried to do it, and uh, one of our PhD students' moms like bled all over the place, like all like and almost passed out because he couldn't get it in correctly. It's an extremely difficult skill. Okay, they were trying to place them in the brachial artery and in the brachial vein. Venous ones are easy because there's such high pressure. If you hit the artery and you don't get the catheter in correctly, then the blood just flies out all over the place. When people measure this, they often do it during exercise in the femoral artery. So femoral line in the artery, femoral line in the vein, and then you ride a bike or you do knee extension or something, and we watch what happens to the amount of oxygen from a sample of blood in the artery and what happens to a sample from the vein. Your assumption is we know what's going in and we roughly know what's coming out, okay? We can then decide how much was taken into that particular tissue. How did it change during exercise? How does it change if we change altitude, et cetera, et cetera. We don't ever measure this very often anymore, right? We do it a lot in Scandinavian countries because their IRBs let them do whatever. And people are like, sure, you can run one into my aorta. That's fine. Okay. So what else? But this is the thing that can be done. Okay? What we see. Is that during exercise, AVO2 difference goes up maybe two or three or four fold. So cardiac output goes up, and in conjunction with that, AVO2 difference is also going to go up. So as you get more blood to the tissue, the tissue will then also extract more. So when we look at this, as you guys will see in the next, um, in, in, actually in the next slide, arterial O2 concentration is pretty constant. The thing that changes is what's happening on the venous side. There's, there's X amount, and you can't saturate hemoglobin any more than it is. So it's the venous side that tends to fall, and it's going to be on that extraction. Okay. Does that make sense? Other than some of you are now squeamish about talking about people bleeding all over the place. My wife hates blood. Okay. If you touch my wife, like in the crook of her elbow right here, she will pass out. I'm not kidding. She will pass out. Okay. We had to get hyped up for a week. I'm not kidding. A week before she could go and give blood when she was pregnant so that we could run because um, ladies, y'all will learn this. If you're over like 34, you're considered a geriatric mother, um, which is the worst term in the world. But we did a bunch of genetic testing and things because we were at a higher risk because of our age on some things. And she had to give like four vials of blood. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like, a week of like, this is going to be okay. Like, you got this, you got this, you got like It was crazy, okay? She cannot just give blood. She just passes out. One of our dogs had something fall on his tail when she was home by herself, and then he bled everywhere. <laughs> Down she goes. And then she calls me at work and is like, Truman's bleeding. You have to come home now. I've already passed out once, and I need to stop. Like, I can't stop the bleeding. Like, just <laughs> down, okay? I know some of y'all are probably a little squeamish. Like, oh. That's what's going on. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's talk about breathing. We did it. We kind of, we I sort of buried the lead with the breathing side of things. But here's the mechanics of breathing, right? You guys know how your diaphragm works. I assume 
you breathe, you contract your diaphragm, it falls. This is all about air pressure. So the space inside the chest cavity gets bigger. As it gets bigger, the pressure drops and then pressure in the chest cavity is less than atmospheric pressure. Air moves in when you open your mouth and your nose. And you then want to breathe out, you relax the diaphragm, it moves up, okay? Squishes that space, raises the pressure, air pressure inside is higher than outside and air goes out. That's kind of how all of that works. That's the mechanics of these things. At rest, you drive this simply by doing diaphragmatic contractions. If you want to forcibly breathe, which is going to be your exercise, or you can do it now, just sitting there if you really want, you bring in the internal external your costal muscles. Um, so we can drive through this particular way. All right, so that's the that's kind of how all of that goes. That's inspiration and expiration. So I, I don't pulmonary stuff is not my face. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. This is not my these are not my favorite kinds of things. But what you see here is something in the output is something called a spirometry test. Anybody ever been tested for asthma? I got tested in high school for asthma. I slept in three days after it was three days. So I was in high school and I had like a three month long um, sort of sinus infection that would never go away. Right. And I would basically I would go in like to play a baseball game and I would run and I would start coughing and I would cough until I threw up. Like couldn't stop like at all and I would be fine. So they tested me for asthma and I had to go and do a thing that looks like what's going on down here. If you take exercise testing and prescription, you will do what's called a spirometry test and it will look like you'll get values that look like this. What we're trying to quantify is your ability to breathe in and breathe out at rest and to breathe in and breathe out under maximal conditions. Like how much can you forcibly suck in how much air can come in if you want, how much air can go out if you want, okay? That's what we're trying to measure. And so the measure that is important for exercise is something called ventilation, okay? Which is abbreviated as VE. So ventilation is the pulmonary equivalent to cardiac output. It's the amount of air that moves into or out of your lungs that flows through in one minute. Okay. We can calculate ventilation by multiplying the number of breaths that you take in a minute, which if you guys are here and you're at rest, might be between like six and 12 or 15. Okay. And what we call tidal volume. Tidal volume. Okay. Which is going to be basically this thing here. Tidal volume is the amount of air that moves every time you breathe in. Okay every time that you breathe in. So respiratory rate is breaths per minute. This is like heart rate. Tidal volume, or the amount of air that comes in every time you do take a breath, is the equivalent of stroke volume. And so by multiplying those together, we can calculate your pulmonary ventilation in liters per minute of air. Okay? When you do the spirometry test, we're going to take this sort of normal these normal breaths, in, out, in, out, in, out, okay? Big, deep breath in, okay? Big, deep breath in, I apologize. This is not tidal volume. Tidal volume is normal tidal volume is here. Big, deep breath in, huge exhalation here, okay? And so we can figure out what does your normal amount of, sort of air that comes in look like in comparison to the most you can breathe in and the most that you can breathe out, okay? This is very useful for people that have some sort of pulmonary pathology, okay? You have emphysema, you have cystic fibrosis, you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, okay? Then each of those are going to affect different parts of sort of what's called this flow volume loop that we have here, okay? But all I want you guys to know for this class is what is ventilation? What are the parameters that go into ventilation? Okay. Are we with me? Yes. No. Maybe. All right. Cool. All right. So we've done this. So we bring air in and we, we exhale air out. That's ventilation. Okay. 
The next piece of things that are important with pulmonary function is something called pulmonary diffusion. Pulmonary diffusion is going to be the act of oxygen and CO2 moving into and out of the lungs, okay, through the pulmonary capillaries at the alveoli into the blood, uh, at specifically at the lungs. We can have tissue diffusion later on down the line, okay? So pulmonary diffusion is gas exchange at the lung. It does two things. It brings O2 in. So you fill your lungs with air. There's higher oxygen content in that air than there is in the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. So O2 moves into the blood. The second thing that happens is that CO2 is higher in the pulmonary capillaries than it is in atmospheric air. There's very tiny amounts of CO2 in our air. Very, very tiny amounts. And so any amount really of CO2 in your blood is going to be more than there is in atmospheric air. So the CO2 comes out of the blood into the alveoli so you can breathe it out that way, okay? That's what's going on. That's how pulmonary diffusion works. Pulmonary diffusion in you guys works generally very, very well. In people that have emphysema, again, they have COPD, one of the things that happens is they may have diffusion issues. They have alveoli that don't work, okay? They can't fill the alveoli, the alveoli are filled with fluid or something. And so pulmonary diffusion becomes a problem. Some lung disorders, if you have COPD, you have a hard time actually breathing. Your diffusion capacity is fine, you just can't get air in, okay? If on the other hand, you have emphysema, you can breathe pretty well, but you can't diffuse. And so you end up in the same sort of place from an outcome standpoint, but the thing that's wrong with you may be a little bit different. Right? That's why these two things are going to be really, really important. Right? During exercise, ventilation goes up and pulmonary diffusion is going to go up correspondingly. Right? And so we've got to make sure that those things are going to work right for us. Here's an example like on the tissue level of pulmonary diffusion. What you see on the far left is a single alveoli. You can see it being all encircled in the pulmonary capillaries, okay? Then you can look at kind of a cross section in the middle picture, and you can see the capillaries that are gonna ring themselves around all of those epithelial cells in the alveoli. And then if you look on the far right, you can notice we've zoomed right down in on kind of the wall of the capillary, and the wall of the alveoli where those two things make contact. That's called the respiratory membrane, okay? The respiratory membrane is two layers thick. It's the wall of the capillary and the wall of the alveoli. This is the actual place where gas exchange occurs, okay? CO2 comes out of the blood across the respiratory membrane into the alveoli. Oxygen comes out of the alveoli across the respiratory membrane into the blood. Right? That's what happens here. So pulmonary diffusion occurs across the respiratory membrane. O2 in, CO2 out. That's the kind of general sense of this. Okay. okay with that as that as a concept. Yes? No, maybe. Sort of with yes. Okay, good. Somebody at least on on Zoom is here. I like it. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. <laughs> good deal. Okay. So now, how and why do these things move? A little bit more chemistry. Okay. I try to explain to you guys why we force you to take Gen Chem. Okay. Anybody have bad memories of Gen Chem? Uh, you guys like Gen Chem? No. Okay. See, parts of chemistry never bothered me because it was math, right? It's like this number of things on this side of the equation, figure out how it matches the other side of the equation. That part of chemistry I like. Some other parts, not so much. What we have here, this is going to be how we create the diffusion gradients so that oxygen moves in the way that we want and CO2 moves in the way that we want. And these things are going to move based upon something called partial pressures, okay? The partial pressure of a gas, okay, 
is going to be equal to the percentage of that gas that is something. So you have air that is a mixture of, let's say, nitrogen, oxygen, and a tiny bit of CO2. Okay. The air has a pressure all to its own. We're at relative sea level, so there's about 760 millimeters of air pressure. Okay. In that, the partial pressure of, let's just say, each gas that makes up the air that we breathe is equal to the overall air pressure multiplied by the percentage of that air that is the particular gas that, we, that we're interested in. So let's just see an example. Our air is about 79% nitrogen, okay? So if we assume that we have 760 millimeters of mercury of air pressure, and you multiply that by 79, you find 79% of that, you will find that the partial pressure of nitrogen in atmospheric air at sea level is about 600 millimeters of mercury, okay? So it's pretty high. So if you want nitrogen to move from one place to another, you need to have a mixture of gases in the air that's 600. You need to have a second mixture of gas that has a nitrogen concentration or nitrogen pressure that is lower than 607 millimeters of mercury. And then the nitrogen will move from high concentration to low. Okay? We don't really care about nitrogen very much. What we care about are oxygen and CO2. Okay, oxygen makes up almost 21% of atmospheric air. So it's got a partial pressure of about 159 millimeters of mercury. Okay, CO2 is only about three hundredths of a percent. So it's only about 0.2 millimeters of mercury. So if I want oxygen to move from in the lungs into the capillaries, the capillaries have to have an oxygen partial pressure less than 159. If I want CO2 to come out of the capillaries in the lungs into the atmospheric air, then there has to be more CO2 in my blood than 0.2 millimeters of mercury. Okay? Does the general idea of that make sense to you guys? You don't have to have these things memorized. I'm not going to ask you to calculate these in any way, shape, or form on the test or anything else, but does that in general make sense? Yes? Yes. Okay. So let me give you an example of how this can, you know what, I'll tell you what happens, then we'll do an altitude example and we'll come back. Okay? So look on, on here what we're gonna see. So this is gonna show you guys, right, water vapor, nitrogen, CO2, and oxygen in the air. And what you see is dry air, which is what we're breathing, okay? You can see the percentage of each one of these in dry air. You can see then the partial pressure in dry air. Then you're going to see what gets into the alveoli. One of the things that happens as air moves into the alveoli, into your lungs, is we add water vapor to it, okay? Now, if it's very, it's a very humid July day here in Oklahoma, we may not add, have to add very much water vapor. We add some water vapor. As we add water vapor, right, then the partial pressure of CO2 goes up and the partial pressure of oxygen goes down, okay? So it goes from like 160 down to about 100 and the CO2 goes from about 0.2 up to about 40. And the nitrogen is also going to go down. We don't really care about nitrogen, it's pretty constant all the time. What that creates then in arterial blood, okay? I mean, I'll do this other way. You have venous blood that arrives at the lung. It has a partial pressure of oxygen of about 40, okay? So we've got 40 versus 105. So oxygen goes from, right, alveolar air into the blood. And it almost equilibrates because it's to be about 100. Conversely, we've got more CO2 in venous blood at about 46, and there is an alveolar air. So it comes out and goes into the air, and then it's going to fall to about 40 in arterial blood. So we've got about 100 millimeters of O2, right, in arterial blood, and about 40 of 
CO2. So we create this diffusion grate, about 60 millimeters of mercury for oxygen, and about only six for CO2. It's much, much easier for CO2 to move. Okay. So it requires a much, much smaller diffusion gradient to be able to, to kind of do what we want. Okay. So you can imagine then as exercise intensity goes up, the amount of oxygen in venous blood falls below 40. It gets smaller and smaller. So our diffusion gradient gets even bigger for O2 to come in. You can also imagine then as O2 use goes up, CO2 in the blood is also going to go up. So it's going to get over 46. So the diffusion mm -hmm. gradient to get CO2 out also goes up. Okay? So exercise creates conditions where our gradients and these partial pressures get bigger. So it's easier to bring oxygen in and it's easier to get CO2 out. And this is really important because it's one of the reasons that we can exercise. This is a good thing that's going to happen. Okay. Now, let me, let me go back and do a different, and do a little bit of an example and explain to you guys why, why it is that altitude can be such a problem, okay? Let's do this. Let me look something up really, really quickly, okay? In air at altitude, the percentage that is nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2 stays constant, okay? On the top of Mount Everest, there's still 21% oxygen in that air. Let me do this. Air pressure on Mount Everest. Okay. The air pressure on Mount Everest is 253 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So we've gone from 760 down to 253. So some quick math. 253 multiplied by 0 0.2093, okay? We're at 52. There's 52 millimeters of mercury of oxygen pressure, all right? We lose about a third as we humidify it to get it into the alveolar air. So we'll divide that by three, multiply that by two. So now we're down to 35 millimeters of mercury-ish of O2 partial pressure in your lungs on the top of Mount Everest, okay? 35. At rest, if you've got 40 in venous blood and there's 35 in the lungs, is oxygen gonna come in? No, it's gonna go out, okay? It's gonna want to go out. And so that's why altitude can be so bad. That's why it can be so dangerous is you've got this, you mess the gradients up because there's so much less air that we're gonna have a hard time being able to, being able to pick away, okay? Now it tends to work. You can get off of the oxygen on top of Mount Everest and actually breathe for a little while, um, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna make it very, very long if you do those kinds of things. Okay. All right, does that make sense? You guys follow me? All right, let's take a three minute break during which you will all do some jumping jacks and raise your, uh, raise your breathing frequency and your raise your cardiac output. Okay, so that by the clock up there that barely works and jumps around, we'll go at, um, at 11.45. So we'll take a little break and then we'll start up and do a little bit more, okay? A little bit. But these are the things that regulate pulmonary ventilation or regulate breathing at rest. So you have a control center that's called the respiratory center. It's in the hypothalamus um, in your brain, and it monitors and receives signals about gases in arterial blood, and it then sends signals to the motor cortex, which then signal to like the diaphragm to breathe, okay? So the respiratory centers send out periodic signals much like the SA does. If you're not paying attention, you still breathe, right? You still are going to breathe. It's much like heart rate, okay? Unlike heart rate, you do have some level to voluntarily override these signals from the respiratory center, but you can't hold your breath until it kills you. That you can't override it for forever, all right? And you can only make it go up so, so far. The primary thing that the respiratory centers are monitoring 
are carbon dioxide and hydrogen, okay? Carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's really measuring things that are byproducts of metabolism. So those things are picked up by what we call chemoreceptors. So you have receptors for CO2, which are primarily located in the aorta and in your carotid arteries um, in your neck. And they're checking arterial CO2 concentration. When those receptors get activated, they signal to the hypothalamus, the respiratory centers, which then tell the diaphragm to contract more, more forcefully and more frequently, okay? Hydrogen does the same thing. As your blood becomes more acidic, which happens during high intensity exercise, then that's going to further drive some level of breathing, right? You can actually blow off more CO2 or do something to lower hydrogen levels in the blood and you can lower your breathing rate. You can hyperventilate. If you want to hold your breath for a longer period of time, you need to do some very serious like deep breaths beforehand, really big exhalations, blow off that extra CO2, then hold your breath because you're getting rid of extra CO2. You also have stretch receptors in the bronchioles and in the alveoli um, that are going to, if you breathe too deeply and you stretch them too much, they're going to function to try to shorten breathing so you don't overstretch them. Um, and so that, the stretch receptors tend to raise breathing rate and lower breathing depth. And then we do obviously have some level of conscious control um, over, over all of these things. And so whatever your breathing rate and depth are, whatever your ventilation is right now, it's the net total of kind of all of these things that are going on at each of the moments, okay? If we look at what happens during exercise, pulmonary ventilation changes in two phases, okay? There's a very immediate increase that we call phase one. A phase one increase in breathing is not detected by chemicals. It's not detected by changes in CO2 or changes in hydrogen. It is driven by body movements. You also have, you have these receptors in your joints called proprioceptors, okay? Called propri Anybody heard of a proprioceptor? Yes? Yes. It's a proprioceptor. You just heard of it before, okay? Proprioceptors sense position. Where is your limb in three-dimensional space, okay? And so you have proprioceptors that are connected to the respiratory centers. And so as you move a limb, the body senses the movement and thinks, ooh, exercise may be coming. Let's raise our breathing rate and depth. That's the early phase one that increases. They're very, very fast. After that, we have a more gradual increase that we call phase two, that is what's driven by changes in the chemical environment in the blood, like increases in CO2 and increases in hydrogen. Okay. Assuming that the exercise is maybe moderate to kind of lowish on the vigorous intensity end, we should be able to reach a steady state in ventilation during those exercise intensities. At very high intensities, very severe intensity exercises, breathing rate will just kind of track upwards because the, the increase in hydrogen, it's going to continue to drive us up. But we may be able to kind of get this nice steady state after, say, about a minute or two adjustment period on the front end. After exercise, after exercise, breathing tends to stay elevated for a period of time. It does not immediately come right back down. Okay. This is because metabolism stays elevated afterwards. So we're continuing to have elevated levels of CO2 as your tissues attempt to recover, okay? Heart rate stays up, that costs us extra energy. We're clearing uh, lactate, we're clearing and driving pH back to a normal place. We're continuing to do thermoregulation and some things. And so energy expenditures up, so breathing stays elevated, okay? That's what happens post-exercise. Eventually it should come back down 
to a place that is relatively close to rest. Okay. Once pH and CO2 and temperature get back down to kind of bringing the baseline down. Okay. So that's the physiology that kind of underlies much of those things. There are a few breathing irregularities. Um, there's a thing called dyspnea, which is when you're short of breath, you have a hard time catching your breath. You see this very often in people that have pulmonary disorders. You see it in people that have asthma, people that have kind of advanced stages of COVID and things. And it is caused by an inability to adjust your breathing rate and frequency to increases the P stands for the partial pressure of CO2 and the partial pressure um, of the hydrogen ions. It may be due to poor conditioning of your respiratory muscles. You have poor conditioning in your diaphragm, but it may also indicate that there are, there are problems in the way the lungs are functioning or in the receptors that are sensing the CO2 and things in, in arterial blood. It's one of the most common kinds of irregularities that we're going, that we're going to see. Okay. Hyperventilation is over breathing. Okay. You're going to sometimes forcibly, other times it's involuntary. You're going to essentially have this heightened drive to breathe. Sometimes it can be kind of slow, rhythmic, and very deep. Oftentimes if people have, say, a panic attack or something like that, it's, you're going to have these very short, rapid breaths. You're just like, you're <laughs> doing all of that because you breathe more, you're actually going to breathe out additional CO2. You blow off more CO2 and you further lower your arterial CO2 levels. Okay. So... There's some, some kind of stuff there that is going to go on. Um, another thing that is, we call it an irregularity, truly really just a, a unique circumstance. It's called the Valsalva maneuver. You guys heard of Valsalva at all? Yes, Kay, you're nodding your head. Yes, Kay, what's the Valsalva maneuver? When I breathe in a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to like build up a bunch of pressure in your head while not breathing. So we are going to build up a lot of pressure. It's not necessarily in our head though, in our chest. Yes. Okay. If I told all of you, you're about to pick up something heavy. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to hold your breath, right? Like we're going to, we're going to pick this up. You hold your breath. You contract your diaphragm, close your mouth and nose, and you pressurize in the chest cavity very, very high pressure. What that does is, is it gives you something to sort of work against as you pick up the heavy object and it keeps your internal organs from getting smished, okay? From getting smished. So Valsalva, pressurize all of this. You get very high intra-abdominal or intra-thoracic pressures. We do it during heavy exercise. It's good because it keeps our organs from getting switched. It's bad because the pressure gets so high, it makes your blood pressure go way up, okay? During Valsalva, you may get systolic blood pressures north of 400 millimeters of mercury. Diastolic pressures over 200 or 250 millimeters of mercury, okay? For most of us, you guys, it's not a problem, not a big deal. Your, your arteries are very elastic. They can handle all of that for older adults people that have aneurysms and things, that kind of an increase in pressure can potentially be very, very dangerous. And so if you have people that are hypertensive, if you have people that are recovering from say a heart attack, one of the things that we wanna to try to do is have them avoid doing the Valsalva maneuver, right? Have them avoid doing the Valsalva maneuver. Okay, so. What are the cardiovascular responses to exercise? These all should seem pretty straightforward to you, okay? All of them should be pretty straightforward. We increase cardiac output, we increase blood flow to the skin, we decrease blood flow to the kidneys and spleen. So this area in here is called the splanic region, okay? Liver, kidneys, okay? Intestines, about half of your blood flow at rest is going to your liver and your kidneys. Not that much goes to skeletal muscle. During exercise, blood flow there goes down. Blood flow to muscles in your skin goes way, way up. 
Flow to the brain stays pretty much constant at all times. Increased blood flow in the coronary arteries, some blood flow to the heart goes up, and we get an increase in systolic pressure, which is going to help us drive blood out to our peripheral tissues. Okay. What needs to happen during exercise is we have to balance a maintenance of blood pressure with making sure that we can supply adequate blood flow to muscles in the heart and to the brain. Okay. That's the heart and the brain always need blood. During exercise, everything else goes to the muscles. That's going to be our goal. We don't care. This is about fight or flight, right? If you're about to get eaten by a velociraptor, okay, then you need to run away or fight it off in some ways. Nobody really cares if you're going to digest whatever you had for lunch on that day. So that's kind of why, why this is going to, be, going to be the case. Okay. So let me show you some graphs that are going to show sort of what happens in the midst of all of these things. Okay, here we have cardiac output in liters per minute. I'm at rest, I'm at about five liters per minute of cardiac output, okay? A stroke volume of about 80 milliliters per beat, a heart rate of about 70 beats per minute, okay? We're gonna get pretty close then to about a little over five liters per minute of cardiac output. I'm on a treadmill and I'm gonna start walking. This is in kilometers per hour. So just take and multiply it by about two and we're gonna get pretty close. So I'm at four kilometers, no, wait, divide it by two, sorry. I'm like, why am I not, I'm not walking at eight miles an hour. So I'm walking at about two miles an hour, really, really slow. It's my favorite way to walk. It drives my wife crazy. Have I told you guys that my wife is five foot three and our waist occurs at the same place? My wife is very short and she is all arms and legs and like has no midsection. She has a really difficult time buying pants because of all of this. And I am all midsection and I have little baby T-Rex arms and legs, but we're, you know, I'm 5'10", she's 5'3", and our waist is at the exact same place. She walks really fast. That was my point was that her stride length is actually longer than mine when we walk because her legs are so long in comparison to her height in, in that way. We're very fascinated to see what happens to our daughter. Is our daughter going to end up being like perfectly proportioned, or is she going to end up one way or the other, like one of us? We're going to cancel each other out on um, these kinds of things. But two miles an hour, I like that. That's nice and slow. Cardiac output is barely above what it is at rest. As you speed up and you go from walking to jogging to running pretty fast, cardiac output is going to go up in a relatively linear manner. Now, out here, there is a limit, okay? There's a limit. There's a top end to what your cardiac output can be. You can only increase your heart rate so much, okay? Mackenzie, how old are you? 23. What can we make your heart rate go up to? Do you remember the equation? No? Does anybody remember the equation for calculating max heart rate? 220 minus your age. 220, 220 minus your age. So Mackenzie's max heart rate would be about 197. About 197. You can only make heart rate go up so much. You can also only make stroke volume go up so much. Your left ventricle is only so big. You can only fit a certain, there's a max amount of blood that can go in and there's a maximal length of contraction. So at some point, you reach age-predicted max heart rate, you reach maximal stroke volume, and so cardiac output is going to, you can't make it go up anymore. Once you get to this place, you're not exercising for much longer, okay? We're not going to exercise for very much longer. So there is a limit. If I want to make myself a better endurance athlete, I need to do something to make my maximal cardiac output go up, okay? It needs to be able to go up. So we'll talk about that when we get into adaptations to aerobic training, okay? Okay, so what makes this go up? Well, let's talk about what happens with heart rate. I wrote that the heart rate increase is the most important, it's probably the most consistent thing that increases across a host of exercise intensities that makes cardiac output go up, okay? What happens is, as you go from rest to walking, you remove vagus input, so you remove the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Then once that's all gone, you begin to add on top of all of that epinephrine and norepinephrine onto the SA nerve, and you're going to get sympathetic input, and that's going to continue to raise heart rate. One of the big things that happens when you exercise is you get this giant increase in release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. You get a big outflow from the sympathetic nervous system. Big part of the fight or flight response is going to be triggered from here. That's going to continue until you get to a place where you've essentially maxed out the ability of epinephrine and norepinephrine to stimulate the SA nerve. That's age related. That's why you reach this age related max on there. Stroke volume also goes up. Okay. And so Dr. Mike is going to talk a lot about this. We spend a huge amount of time talking about specifically the regulation of stroke volume in my master's level advanced exercise physiology class. But one of the things that you need to appreciate is we increase what we call preload and we increase contractility. All that this means, all that preload represents is this is how much blood is in the left ventricle right before it contracts, okay? So when I say that preload goes up, that means that the left atria is squirting more blood and filling the left ventricle to a greater extent, okay? That's what preload is. So if I get a bigger preload, that's going to lead to more and a larger stroke volume. We'll get into it just a little tiny bit of how and why that works. Also, I increase contractility. Contractility is a measure of the strength of contraction of the left ventricle, okay? How hard is it squeezing together to eject blood out, okay? The increase in contractility is primarily driven by norepinephrine, okay? Norepinephrine binds the receptors on the left ventricle, on the cardiac muscle, and it makes it contract more forcefully. So, Preload is affected by a host of different things. Contractility is primarily driven by your effort. Okay. We also get a decreased resistance to flow. So what happens is by vasodilating arterioles to all of our skeletal muscle, we're lowering peripheral blood pressures, and it makes it easier for blood to move into those tissues. So more is going to want to move out. Okay. That's again kind of some complicated mathematical things, but I just want you guys to. Just get a little bit of an, a little bit of an idea of what all is going on here. Okay, so one of the things that affects preload, one of the primary things that affects preload, is a concept called venous return. Okay? In human physics, y'all talk about venous return and the things that affect venous return. Do you, you guys are, are nodding your heads? Some of you look at me like I don't know what that is, Doctor Black. Anybody? Everybody remember, venous return is how much blood from the venous side is coming back into the heart, okay, during sort of every period of diastole, right? how much is coming in. And so there are some things that have to do with veins and some special structures in veins that help us get blood back to the heart, that help us with venous return, okay. If again, if you've ever stood up too fast from laying down, maybe after you've done about a heavy exercise and you feel lightheaded, part of what has happened is you've not matched your venous return to, to your blood pressure. That's why you feel lightheaded. So things are gonna help us, okay? Blood comes back to the heart along a pressure gradient, okay? So if I can lower the pressure around the superior and the inferior vena cava and make that pressure smaller, then it will be easier for blood and other veins to get and want to kind of suck it towards that place. One of the ways we do that is with breathing, okay? When you breathe very deeply and you increase the size of the chest cavity and you lower intrathoracic pressure, it lowers the pressure in the inferior and superior of the caves because there's less air kind of pushing on. In doing that, that helps to kind of move blood from veins in your legs and your arms back into that particular area. Right? So that goes up during exercise. You breathe more deeply. That's going to help drive some back. Okay. 
You also have things in veins called valves. And the valves prevent backwards flow of blood. So once the blood gets to a certain place, it gets pushed through the flaps, through the doors, and then the doors lock behind them. They only swing in one direction. And so here's a valve. Blood can get through and move towards the heart, but it cannot go backwards. Okay? It cannot go backwards. And so when I use breathing and I pull the blood towards the heart, it moves that direction, and then the valves keep it from going going out there, okay? Most of the blood in your body, or the majority is in your veins, and when you sit or you stand, most of it due to gravity is going to be in your legs, okay? It's going to be in your legs. And so we need a way to try to force more of it back to my heart, which is basically here, which is uphill from my legs, okay? One of the other big things that we do in big ways that exercise helps us increase venous return is something called the muscle. Pump, right? I told you guys last week that veins are soft. Veins are very squishy. Okay, They don't have a lot of vascular smooth muscle. You can compress a vein relatively easily. So what happens when you contract most of your muscles is the muscles contract and the pressure around the veins goes up due to those muscle contractions. Okay. As that happens, the veins run between the muscles, the muscles contract, pressure goes up, they squeeze the vein and they force blood forward. They, they create higher pressure and it drives it towards lower pressure. Okay. There are two things that we do for people that feel lightheaded or after they've finished exercising that are going to take advantage of this. Okay. When you feel lightheaded and they have you lay down and, put, and prop your feet up, they're putting your heart right lower than your legs. So now gravity is helping to pull blood back to the heart. And when you run a race or you've done something and they tell you, don't stop right when you're done, you need to walk around, keep moving, keep moving. What you're doing is you sent all of this blood to your legs. You're going to keep running, you're going to keep contracting to squeeze those veins with the muscle pump to kind of get blood back to the heart so that once you've stopped with the exercise, the knee's going to fall and you can kind of help yourself recover. Okay. So during exercise, muscle pump goes up, breathing goes up, pulls more blood back. That makes more blood going back into the right side of the heart, which means the vein's going to get more into the left ventricle and that makes stroke volume go up. Okay. Questions? Dr. Mike will talk about some other things that are going to affect preload, other things that affect contractility in, in exercise fits, some really fascinating kind of cardiovascular things. So here are the same graphs that I showed you guys for cardiac output, but specifically for heart rate and specifically for stroke volume. Okay. Heart rate's pretty simple. It looks just like the cardiac output graph. It just goes up in a linear manner, kind of like a straight line until you get out here to age predicted max heart rate. Oh, um, not that interesting. Stroke volume is different though. And this is why I want you to know this, okay? Stroke volume goes up for a while in most people up until about 40 or 50% of their maximal exercise capacity. And then stroke volume levels off and it cannot go up anymore, okay? As I said, the heart can only contract so hard. You can only put so much blood into your left ventricle. So let's do let's do some little example here of something. Uh, all right. So McKenzie was twenty three. Do I have anybody else that was that's twenty three in class? Anybody else? No. No. Okay. Casey, you mind telling us how old you are? Twenty one. Casey's twenty one. Anybody else is twenty one? Hands up. Okay. Kylie, you're close. We're gonna pick you. Okay. Let us assume. Well, we're not assuming. We have Casey and Kyla that are both 21. What would be their age predicted max heart rate? 199. So that's the same for both of them. Okay. Their maximal cardiac output is maximal age predicted heart rate. So 199 multiplied by their maximal stroke volume. 
So which of the two of them is going to have the larger or the potential to have the larger cardiac output and why? Whoever has the largest stroke volume. Very good, Kay. So how do we know who would have the larger stroke volume? Because I can tell you, if you want to know who's going to be the better endurance athlete, most likely, who's going to have the higher aerobic fitness that we'll talk about on Wednesday, the higher VO2 max, it's whichever one of them has the highest cardiac output. So if they're the same age, we need to know who's got the bigger stroke volume. How do we do that? How do we guess at who has the biggest stroke volume? So, like, my grandma has this thing when you get into it and it rises, and I guess that's like, does that tell you your stroke volume? Probably not. That probably tells something about lung volume, maybe, or lung pressures. Oh. So, that's okay. Anybody know? If you had to guess at the person in class that had the biggest stroke volume, who would you guess? Okay. The biggest person. Good cop. Why would the biggest person have the biggest stroke volume, do you think? You're right. Biggest heart. We got the biggest heart. Okay. Who do we think between Casey and Kylie has the biggest heart? Like actual anatomical heart, <laughs> not like metaphorical, right? On, on those kinds of things. All right. Whoever has the biggest heart, is there a part of the heart that we think matters the more than just its overall size? The ventricle size. Whichever of them has the largest left ventricle is probably going to have the largest stroke volume. Okay? So in people that are roughly the same age, whoever has the biggest heart has the biggest cardiac output because they've got the biggest stroke volume. And so in people that are of similar age, you guys will see that stroke volume matters tremendously, tremendously in determining aerobic capacity, determining endurance performance. So guess what changes when you train a heart? Your heart gets bigger, your left ventricle gets bigger. Okay? You can't train your max heart rate. It just is whatever it is. For a while, but you can train your stroke volume by making your left leg. So that's going to be really, really important. Okay. You can tell all your friends, all of the things being equal, the person with the biggest heart will win the race. That's my dad joke for the day. Okay. All right. So we talked about this. We did all of this. We've talked a fair amount about blood distribution. Okay. So blood distribution really sim simply is as you see on the bottom at rest, most of the blood or about half of the blood in your body is going to liver, stomach, intestines, kidneys, we call them the splenic regions, okay? You have a constant amount that's going to your brain, a little bit that goes to the heart, a little bit even smaller that goes to the bones, some to the skin, and a percent that goes to skeletal muscle. During exercise, the brain stays the same, the heart goes up, skeletal muscle goes up, everything else pretty much goes down. Skin goes up too, okay? We must keep the brain where it is. And then at all costs, we're gonna make heart and muscles go up during exercise. That's how blood distribution is going to get changed, okay? So if most of the blood in your body is in your digestive region or in your splenic regions, so you've eaten lunch and then you go jump in the pool right afterwards, your mom's like, you can't get in the pool for a half an hour or an hour after you've eaten, right? Well, what happens? I go jump in the pool, and I start moving around and I stop sending blood to the splenic regions, stop sending blood to stomach and intestines, and all goes to skeletal muscle. I have crap stuck in my digestive system and it makes my tummy upset. And that is the reason why that's the old wives' tale of why you don't want to go swimming for a half an hour after. There's some actual physiological truth to those kinds of things. Okay. Did we talk about the blood flow to your feet when you're scared? Did we talked about that. No? You guys have heard the saying, the person got cold feet, right? Some of you may or may not yet um, have, a, have a friend that's like, nope, I'm supposed to get married and I'm not doing it. I'm out. I'm out. Right? We had a friend that did that like the day before the wedding. So um, 
Better, better to do that than to go through with something or have to do it. Say like, oh, they got cold feet, they didn't want to do it, okay? So what are the things that happens when you get a stress response, okay? An acute stress response is you release epinephrine and norepinephrine and you vasodilate everything except for, um, or you vasoconstrict like everything except for kind of what's going to skeletal muscle. And so what happens is when you scare people, at least initially, blood flow to their skin goes down. And if blood flow to the area goes down, the temperature goes down. One of my favorite shows, it's no longer on TV, but you can watch it was a thing called Mythbusters that was on Discovery Channel. And they did a Mythbusters episode where they had a thermal camera and they took pictures of people's feet in a box and they'd like throw snakes and spiders and things whatever you were afraid of most in there. And you would watch and initially it goes whoosh, right down and you get cold feet and you get scared in those ways. And it's all about where blood distribution is going down. When you exercise, you're, there's things that are gonna be released that are gonna overcome all of this vasoconstriction response from epinephrine and norepinephrine. You're gonna get more muscle, you're gonna get more skin and those kinds of things, okay? All right, um, we talked about that. Let me do this really, really quickly. Um, and so that kind of leads us into well, we, we mentioned that arterioles take blood to different tissues. We talked about the smooth muscle there, but the other thing that's that, um, that arteries do and arterioles deal with that smooth muscle is they respond to input. Okay. And so I can release things that tell the smooth muscle to contract or the smooth muscle to relax. Here's one of my favorite pictures. What you see here on the top is an arterial. It looks like the Michelin tire man, or like a little baby, right? Those little rings around the arterial, that's vascular smooth muscle. They've then stripped all of that away. And what you see in the bottom picture are sympathetic nerves that are going into that smooth muscle. So you have sympathetic nerve and innervation into your vascular smooth muscle that surrounds arterioles. That those, those nerves release epinephrine and norepinephrine that tell the smooth muscle to contract. So generally, when you get a stress response, everything contracts, and then you release some things locally in those tissues that counteract that contraction, but then let more blood come to those areas. So that's how with one signal, we can get, we can get stuff, we can sort of get a differential response all across, all across the body. Okay, I know it's about time to have to go. This is going to talk about Ohm's law and Poiseuille's law, the big takeaway. We'll cover just a little tiny bit of this on, um, on, on Wednesday, and that'll be where we stop. Okay, so very good. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Please make sure you get your labs turned in. If you don't or you have a question, send it to me.